the Watmo Lecture in Linguistics. This is a series that was created through the generosity of the Watmo family and of the late Mrs. Verona Taylor Watmo in particular. Um, I'd like to begin by supplying you with a little context to this, and I'm going to do it with a personal reminiscence. In January 1961, I officially became a linguist. Uh, this happened through my signing up as a linguistics concentrator with the chairman of the linguistics department, Professor Joshua Watmo, at the department's headquarters at 54 Dunster Street. This is a building that no longer exists. It was torn down a few years later to make room for Holyoke Center. Professor Watmo was then in the anti-penultimate year of his Harvard career, but he still looked pretty much as he had when he sat for the 1955 portrait of him by G. Paul Bishop that now hangs in the Smythe collection of Widener Library. There it is. Um, the signature boutonniere, the bow tie, all those were present at our first meeting as well. Um, I don't remember a whole lot about the conversation we had that morning. You had to combine linguistics with another subject in those days, as you still can, but don't have to. And I said I wanted to combine it with mathematics. This made Professor Watmo very happy. He said, are you a math whiz, Mr. Yazanov? <laughs> uh, it, was, it was not the first, but it may well have been the last time anyone ever wondered that about me. Uh, <laughs> Together, we filled out a plan of study, which prominently included my very first linguistics course, Linguistics 100. I was a sophomore. It was slated to be given by Professor Watmo that very spring term approaching. Um, linguistics 100, taught by Professor Watmo, was a distant ancestor of the present Social Analysis 34. Uh, it was a course like no other I had taken. In the 1963 profile of Joshua Watmo and the Harvard Crimson, written uh, in May of that year on the eve of his retirement, the Crimson's writer described the Linguistics 100 experience as follows, and I now quote from the Crimson, until I tell you I'm not, I am. Um, Linguistics 100, language, is impressively described in the catalog of courses as dealing with such topics as the theory of communication, language and the nature of man, language and literature, and so forth. Actually, when Professor Watmo lectures in Linguistics 100, he dispenses with these problems in 30 minutes. The rest of the hour gives him a chance to hold forth on everything that he feels needs speaking out against. He does this in the most elegantly precise English to be heard in Cambridge, and often illustrates his points with Latin or Greek quotations, which he clearly expects his listeners to understand. His manner of delivery varies with his subject. He can be quietly incisive, example. A professor should be a person, not a clod. The whole system of PhDs in certain fields tends to turn professors into clods. I do not have a PhD. <laughs> or, if the situation demands, violently destructive, example. Linguistics has much to offer psychology. Psychology has nothing to offer linguistics. <laughs> and that nothing is wrong. <laughs> it was the heyday of behavioralism, and it wasn't wrong to say that at all. Uh, um, uh, certain issues, whether anyone has the right to control what professors say in classes, for one, turn him purple with rage, invariably an awesome transformation. And when it is all over, Watmo smiles, adjusts his cornflower, takes up his walking stick, and leaves the lecture room contented. <laughs> End of description. Um, this colorful figure whom I thus encountered as an undergraduate was, of course, an eminent scholar. He had spent most of his academic career at Harvard. Uh, born in Britain and educated there, he had been brought here in 1926 at the age of 29 by President Lowell who hired him to represent the academic field of comparative philology, more or less what we would call Indo-European linguistics or Indo-European studies today. As professor of comparative philology at Harvard, Watmo presided over the Committee on Comparative Philology, which became the Department of Comparative Philology in 1941, with Watmo as its chairman. Ten years later, in 1951, 
both the academic landscape and Watmo's own interests had shifted to the point where a name change became desirable. The Department of Comparative Philology thus became the Department of Linguistics. The name change was pretty complete, but users of Room B, the department's small collection and wide new library, may have noticed that the books in that room have call numbers beginning with COPH, standing, of course, for comparative philology. Joshua Watmo was, in short, the founder of the Harvard Linguistics Department. As a scholar, Watmo was first and foremost a specialist in Latin and the other languages of the Italian peninsula in Roman and pre-Roman times. Among these were the Celtic languages, Lepontic and Cisalpine Gaulish in North Italy, which led to his later interest in the Celtic of ancient Gaul proper. His first major book was Pre-Italic Dialects of Italy, 1933, which was co-authored with his teacher, uh, R.S. Conway. This was actually a two-volume set, uh, or three if you count the indices, of which the first was, domina was dominated by Conway's treatment of the Venetic language, and the second, which covered inter alia Messapic and the Celtic dialects, was by Watmo. Uh, after this came the foundations of Roman Italy in 1937, and the microfilm publication in 1950 and 51 of the dialects of ancient Gaul, which was based on his meticulous examination of the primary evidence in situ. Unhappily, Watmo did not live to complete the grammatical analysis portion of this imposing work. A print version of the dialects of ancient Gaul was issued posthumously in 1970 by Harvard University Press and remains a fundamental source. In the 1950s, Watmo's interests turned more and more to general linguistics and in particular to the application of mathematical and statistical methods to the study of language. This was, of course, why he liked linguistics concentrators who were math whizzes. Uh, his new, more theoretical direction was reflected in his two books of the mid-50s. The first of these was Language, a Modern Synthesis, published in Britain in 55 and in the U.S. in 56. The second was the published version of his 1955 Sather Lectures at Berkeley, which appeared in 1956 as Poetic, Scientific, and Other Forms of Discourse, a New Approach to Greek and Latin Literature. This was a pioneering effort to bring the insights of linguistics to bear on the study of literature, a project that remains alive and well today, as today's speaker will demonstrate by example. Wadma was also, of course, a prolific author of articles and reviews and served in many professional and editorial functions, including nine years at the helm of Harvard Studies in Classical Philology. Among his many honors and distinctions, I might mention his college professorship at the 1949 Linguistic Institute and his presidency of the LSA, the Linguistic Society of America, in 1951. He received a festschrift on his 60th birthday in 1957. Joshua Watmo retired in 1963 and died early, less than a year later, in April 1964. He was survived by his wife, Verona, through whose generosity and devotion to her husband's memory we owe today's occasion, and by their children, Theodora, Theo, Watmo Green, and Jeremy Watmo. Theo sadly died last year, but her husband, Fred Green, and three of their children are here with us today. So is Joshua Watmo's son, Jeremy, whom I would now like to call upon to tell us a little more about his father and mother and the background of the gift establishing the Watmo Lectures. Jeremy. Well, thank you very much. That's a pretty tough act to follow. He pretty much covered my father from A to Z. But I will say this, that if you like what I say today, I have to tell you it's because my brother-in-law, Fred Green, who is sitting there right here, and my wife, Myrna, who is not here, reviewed it. We are up to draft seven to get these remarks put together. Let me start off by introducing Fred's children. Right here is Kathy Green, who is wife of Alan Green, who is Fred's son. Then there is Phil Green. Then there is Carol Nason. And then finally, the father, Fred Green, who for his entire career was professor of chemistry at MIT, and he was also a teaching fellow at Harvard. So I come from a learned family which has been perpetuated uh, into the next generation. Now, I'm not going to present to you a slideshow, but I would like to show you three pictures. This is a picture of my father, my sister Theo, my mother, 
and myself in my christening robes in February 1935. And that is a nice family picture and we, we enjoy it. This is a picture taken in 1958. In, 19, in May of 1958, my father and mother embarked on a six month round the world trip. My father arranged all of the lectures. He arranged for the hotels. He made the travel arrangements. And as Professor Jasanoff uh, mentioned, when I drove them to the airport here in Boston, my father said to the clerk when asked, where are you staying in San Francisco? He said, the Sheraton Hotel. <laughs> and, and the clerk or the counter attendant said, where? And he said, the Sheraton Hotel. And I said, well, of course, he means the Sheridan Hotel. And so she said, OK, that would do. So even by that time, he was still interested in playing with words. And with them, uh, my father and mother, is the wife of the president called the principal of the University of Cape Town in Cape Town, South Africa. The last picture was taken in July of 1963, shortly after my father retired at their home in Winchester, Mass. And uh, my wife, Myrna, took the picture. And as you can see, Fred is on the right. Theo's on the left. I'm behind Theo looking anxiously because Alan is, is trying to with, restrain my son, whose name is Jay, from running up to see his mother. <laughs> and, and I look worried. And of course, my mother and father in the background. Well, so much for the pictures. And uh, uh, two, of the, two of the three pictures had a picture of my sister, Theo, and Fred's husband. Theo was very scholastically inclined. And so my father, not to waste her talent, in the summer of 1940, thought it was really a good idea for him to start teaching her Latin, which he did. For the next five or six summers, Theo was subjected with a great deal of enthusiasm and interest, I might say. She liked this, to being taught languages. She was nine years old in 1940. By 1945, when she was the ripe old age of 35, she had decided she was going to be a chemist. So my dad switched from Latin to German, knowing that all chemists had to know German. So he taught her German with a good deal of interest. She received her AB, her AM, and PhD, all in chemistry, from Harvard and Radcliffe. And Theo died last summer of ovarian cancer. Now, my mother and father were Renaissance people. They bridged the Victorian era crossing uh, to the ever-changing 20th century. There was nothing in my father's background that would have ever suggested that he would be the greatest linguist of his era. He was born in Rochdale, England, which Fred has measured out for me and has told me it's exactly halfway between London and Glasgow. So if you get a map of England, and you draw a straight line, and you divide it in two, you'll be right where Rochdale is. Even in the early 1900s, it was the, still the custom for children, barely in their teens, to leave school and go to work. His mother was told by his principal that my father, or Joshua, my father, had great scholastic ability and he was special, and he was very gifted. As a result, she insisted that he continue his education. I got to digress and say that Rochdale is known for three things. One is Gracie Fields, and those of you who are of my generation know that Gracie Fields at one time was the most popular pop singer and actress in the Western world. And she died on the Isle of Capri sometime in the early 50s. The second thing is the Rochdale Cooperative Pioneer so Society, which is sort of like the Harvard Coop, and it was sort of an early day Walmart. And the third, of course, is my father. <laughs> Through sheer scholastic ability, intellect, and determination, he won scholarships, bursaries, and degrees from both the University of Manchester and Cambridge University. At Cambridge, he was in Emmanuel College, which was also the College of John Harvard. As Professor Jasanoff has said, in the fall of 1926, at the age of 
29, he descended on Cambridge and, and had an appointment to lecture in the classics department and comparative philology. He was assigned study 791, 791 in Widener Library, which was his only study for the entire 38 years that he was at Harvard. He also, if you can believe it, was a proctor briefly at Morris Hall across the Charles River at the business school. My father never accepted the status quo. He was always questioning why. He was thinking of things before their time. For example, in 1948, he believed that voice recognition by machine would come by the mid-1980s. And by the mid-1980s, a company in Lexington was marketing software to do just this. We know, or at least I think we know, and I think I am correct, but I'm not sure, the vocabularies of, that people use consist of a relatively small number of words. My father believed that automatic voice and written translation from one language to another on a real-time basis would soon occur. He was a prolific writer, and my mother spent a number of months creating an inventory of all his writings and it totaled 730. He did much of his writing at home, so he needed to work uninterrupted. My parents came up with a system of flags, red, yellow, green, that were put into a small wooden lighthouse. When the flag was green, you could go and enter and talk to him. If it was yellow, you could enter only if you must. And if it was red, under no circumstances were you allowed to enter, period. <laughs> Theo and I thought this was good fun, and we more or less did as the flags directed. But I can say we both went in when the red flag was there. He attended the Faculty of Arts and Science faculty meetings held in University Hall religiously. I am told he sat in the same place, and I guess the same chair over the years. He was never shy about expressing his opinion when he had something to say on what was being discussed. And he did so clearly, thoroughly, logically, and passionately. In the early 1950s, several events happened. Dean Paul Buck, who was the provost at the time, assigned the department the offices at 54 Dunster Street, as Professor Jasnoff has uh, referenced, uh, in Dudley Hall, which is now, I think, the health center, or, or, or close to it. And uh, uh, the name of the department was changed from comparative philology to the Department of Linguistics to reflect the growing importance of linguistics, not only at Harvard, but throughout the world. He was also the first president of the Ninth International Linguistics Congress, a great honor bestowed on him by his peers. My father was very loyal. He helped and assisted many of his students and others to find rewarding careers. He was never too busy to listen, help, or offer suggestions. He always had a smile on his face, a twinkle in his eye, and a buttonhole in his, uh, cornflower uh, in his lapel buttonhole. My parents were married in October 1931. My mother was careful, cautious, and strong-willed. She lived for another 25 years after my father died. Born in Toronto, Canada, she was one of the first lawyer, women to graduate from the University of Toronto Law School, Osgoode Hall. She, with the help from Theo, had the university press, the Harvard University Press, publish my father's monumental work, Dialects of Ancient Gaul. After many meetings with the press folks, she convinced them to take and use his manuscript as is, the, and the book was published in 1970. For many years, it had steady sales. Prior to my mother's death, she had conversations with Fred and discussions about establishing this lecture. In September 9, 2004, I turned 70, and my wife and I decided to hold my birthday party here in Cambridge. As I walked through the yard before my party, I ended up in Widener Library. When I had been cleared by the attendant, I walked up to the Widener Memorial Room, 
And I always found that interesting because they keep changing the exhibit. From there, I walked up another flight of stairs to his study at 791, but I couldn't look in because there's a curtain on the door and you can't see in. Maybe my father had the curtain, I'm not sure. Then I went two doors away to the linguistics department library, or as I call it, room B. And I was led in by Jeremy Rao, assistant professor of classics and linguistics. The blackboard, and you may recall in, in room B, there's a blackboard right behind the door, had the same indecipherable scribblings on the board that I remember the last time I was in that room. I don't think the board had been cleared, cleaned. It also had books scattered on the table. And I can remember going in there and there were books always over, over the table. I think my father liked that because it showed that somebody was looking at the books rather than leaving them on the shelf. And finally, it had the same pleasant smell that I remembered when I used to go in there. So it was a great family weekend. And as a result, in December of that year, Theo and I forwarded my mother's request to Harvard. So today is the beginning of the annual and happy event, the Joshua and Verona Watmo lectures in the field of linguistics. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Jeremy. And once again, I want to thank the Watmo family on behalf of the department uh, for their kindness and generosity in endowing the Watmo lectures, which are going to be a major event from now on in the life of our now thriving department. Um, I, have, uh, I have another uh, 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 task now, a very pleasant one, which is to introduce today's speaker, uh, the uh, first annual Watmo lecturer. Uh, it, may seem, it may seem surprising and strange, it certainly does to me, to introduce Cal Watkins as, uh, as professor in residence in the Department of Classics and in the program of Indo-European Studies at UCLA, where he has been since 2003. To most of us here, he is more familiar as the Victor S. Thomas Professor of Linguistics and the Classics Emeritus here at Harvard, where he spent most of his career. Like me, Cal Watkins was a Harvard linguistics concentrator in Joshua Watmo's department. But unlike me, he was a serious student of Watmo's and began his teaching career in linguistics during the Watmo years. I was too young. Um, after a brilliant four years as an undergraduate and a period of study abroad as a junior fellow, Cal became assistant professor of linguistics and the classics, which is where his career stood when I met him at the age when he was 29 in the fall of 62. There are a lot of smart 29-year-olds in this narrative today. Uh, things happened quickly in those years, and on Watmo's retirement, Watkins became Watmo's successor as chairman of the Department of Linguistics, hence the second chair. In all, he served for 11 years as chair of linguistics, maintaining an astonishing level of professional activity throughout his Harvard years. From almost the beginning, he was recognized as one of the world's leading Indo-Europeanists, well for brilliant books on the Celtic verb, 1962, the Indo-European verb, 1969, and over 150 articles and reviews. Some of these were collected in the, uh, into the two volumes of Selected Writings, which appeared in 1994, and I should not fail to say that he received an important festrift in 1998. But surely the hard-covered work that best reflects his tastes, interests, and achievements over the past few decades is his 1995 book, How to Kill a Dragon, Aspects of Indo-European Poetics. For many years, Cal Watkins has championed the view which Joshua Watmo also held, that comparative poetics is a branch of comparative linguistics. This is what the Dragon Book was about, and this is what he will talk to us about today. It is therefore a pleasure to welcome Calvert Watkins back to Harvard for the first Watmo lecture entitled The Golden Bowl, Thoughts on the New Sappho and its Asianic Background. Cal.
Thank you, Jay. My student, former colleague, and always friend, Jay, Professor Jay Jasanoff. My fellow Lowell House student and friend, Jeremy Watmo. Members of the Watmo family, colleagues and friends, ladies and gentlemen, it's an honor and a pleasure to return to Harvard to deliver the first Joshua and Verona Watmo lecture. Uh, and to honor the mem memory of my first teacher at Harvard by imitation, which you will recall is the sincerest flattery, I've chosen an ambitious topic of discourse, that is one which aspires to be both poetic and scientific. I hope it'll be worthy of it. Now, against a background of known Asianic Greek uh, contact in the Western Anatolian Aegean inter interface, I consider here first the Homeric formular cosmography of dawn, the bed of Tithonus, Okeanos, ocean, and uh, uh, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, the rising sun, and the seemingly innocuous verb go, with double preverb up into, Greek eis anabainen. Uh, Anatolian Hittite and Luvian religion and cosmology in the second millennium lack altogether a dawn figure, but uh, uh, both of them know two suns, S-U-N, the uh, sun god of heaven who comes up from the sea in a famous passage in uh, the prayer of the Hittite king Muatalis, and the sun goddess of the netherworld, the domain through which the sun travels uh, at night, administering justice and punishing false oath to return to the east. These ideas recur in Homer in Orphic Pythagorean passages in Pindar, as well as the famous invocation beginning Father Zeus and Helios, the sun god, in Book Three of the Iliad, uh, a, an invocation which has particularly striking affinities with Luvian texts uh, relating to the sun god Tiwats and the sun goddess of the netherworld, Tiamasis Tiwats. I then proceed to examine the formulaic behavior of a set of passages in 7th, 6th, and early 5th century Greek poetry figuring the tra trajectories of dawn or the sun and sharing remarkably similar diction. And these include the deployment of the verb ace on a binane, go up into, and together with the sexual overtones of its Iliad, Iliadic, and Hesiodic objects, lechos, meaning bed, and hyperoion, meaning women's bedchamber. These poetic fragments of Mimnermus, Stesichorus, and Aeschylus are nearly all preserved uniquely in a single passage uh, of Athenaeus, which is concerned with what will turn out to be the key word, depas, meaning cup or bowl. And the passages these, which we will look at in due course they, uh, they are formulaically, thematically, and mythographically, in a very real sense, the same. They, they all tell of the rising of the sun at dawn in the east and his nightly journey back to the east in a vessel named a depas, a, a bowl. The new Sappho papyrus a poem on aging, uh, we will get to it later if you want to peek, it's number 26 in the handout uh, on page seven, uh, ends with a four-line exemplum of the myth of Dawn and Tithonus, which furnishes a new and artistically innovative com combination of all the formulaic elements that we've surveyed. And in the Editio Princeps by Gronewald and Daniel in 2004 of this uh, new papyrus, the editors read Eroi Depas with dots under each of the letters. They are, it's not that clear in the papyrus. 
and the infinitive eis om bamenai, meaning to, uh, the whole meaning, go up into the bowl for love or perhaps for lust. A, uh, in the in critical spot, as demanded for dialect reasons. And what this accomplishes is to infuse the object of the doubly preverb uh, go up into, a son of by name, uh, infusing the key word depas, if correctly read, with the sexual overtones of its other objects, lejos, bed, and hyperoion, bedchamber. The depas has become a love nest into which dawn carries to Thonus, bearing him to the ends of the earth. And I argue that the reading of the uh, first editors should be correct, and that the objections raised to it by Martin West in 2005, as well as the alternative proposal of Richard Janko in, at the end of the same year, uh, that these are not cogent. And this will allow us in turn to turn once again to Luvian Anatolia for illumination, namely the origin of the key word depas. Now Martin West in his monumental East Face of Helicon of 1997 has amassed a great deal of evidence for what we may think of as the ideational diffusion from the East of much of Greek cosmography about the sun. By the East, West has in mind and primarily draws from the sumero Akkadian cultural sphere of Mesopotamia and its spread to Hurrian and the West Semitic cultures of the Levant. The channels for this diffusion, its geographical basis and its nature are left largely unspecified by West. But can we be more specific? And in particular, can we point to any singular detail, which is the touchstone of the comparative method? as I've argued elsewhere. A, uh, aerial diffusion, whether linguistic or cultural, is part of the purlieu of the comparative method. A, and aerial, that is geographical, diffusion presupposes contact. A, and uh, it's appropriate, entirely appropriate, to look first at areas where we know independently that cultural contacts took place from an early period and this refers to Hellas and Anatolia in the second millennium BC, uh, which were contiguous over the long western coast of Asia Minor. Uh, you see we have Western Asia Minor on map 1A, uh, which is a map from, drawn by David Hawkins uh, in 1998. And I should, uh, it's fair to point out that when I was in graduate school, the entire map of Western Anatolia in the second millennium BC was a complete blank. Nobody knew where any of these places were. That is something that we have learned since then. Hey, I and others before me have argued since the last decade of the last century for Western Anatolia as a Sprachbund or linguistic area on the basis of shared grammatical features uh, between Anatolian and Greek, like the East, on, East Ionic uh, Eske imperfect uh, and others, and the direction of diffusion is from East to West. The Anatolian dialects of the Western coastal area are principally Luvoid, that is to say forms of Luvian, which is a sister uh, language to Hittite in the Anatolian branch of the family, uh, as appears from the onomastic stock of historical figures of the region like Maduwatas and Kiamaradus, the, uh, these are transparent Luvian names, as appears from the cultural the Luvian affinity of the Lycian language. Lycia is, you see, in the southwest corner of Anatolia uh, and other evidence. And for this reason, I want to look first, well, first, eventually, uh, at Luvian or Luvoid Anatolia for comp comparanda. That's where you're going to find it. Uh, supplementing this with central Anatolian Hittite where necessary. 
in an important article, Nigel Spencer in 1995, uh, an archaeologist calls attention to the archaeological record of Bronze Age and Iron Age Lesbos, the, uh, the island uh, uh, you see on uh, your map uh, uh, where Sappho came from. Uh, and uh, Spencer showed that this island was very, quote, very much an extension of the Anatolian cultural tradition both before and even after the arrival of the Aeolian Greeks. He continues, in the Iron Age, early Iron Age, the cultures of the hinterland to the east were just as accessible as they had been in the Bronze Age when Lesbos formed an outlying part of the Anatolian cultural lake. Various bodies of material from early Iron Age Anatolia have shown that the flow of information, technology, material goods, and even groups of people westward uh, <coughs> uh, to the Aegean region from as far east as the Anatolian Plateau and as far south as northern Syria and Iran did not end with the collapse of the Hittite Empire in the late Bronze Age. And furthermore, the route used for the, this communication was not simply the sea route from southern Anatolia and the Levant, because archaeological evidence indicates that the corridors existed overland through Anatolia, which remained open through the late Bronze Age, early Iron Age transition. And his map is reproduced in 1B in, on page two of the handout. Uh, and you can, uh, the middle of it is precisely the island of Lesbos. West 1997 discusses Homeric dawn formulae uh, uh, like, but when er the early born one appeared, rose fingered dawn. Uh, and comparing the recurring formula in Gilgamesh and apparently unique to it uh, at the first light of dawn, literally upon something of dawn gleaming forth. But considerably more detailed is the formula in Iliad 19, 1, 2, 2, a number two in the handout, a uh, saffron robe dawn a, uh, arose from the streams of ocean to bring light to gods and mortals. We find the crucial cosmographic detail that the dawn comes up from the waters of ocean. And this notion is not, is not Mesopotamian, where the sun always comes up in the mountains. The, uh, the per persistence of this am image as a set topos in Greek is seen half a millennium later in Theocritus II, number three in the handout. Uh, the phrase today when the mares began to run toward heaven bearing rosy fingered dawn from ocean, which is in context simply a very flowery way of saying uh, early this morning. Uh, this goddess dawn in Homer shares her bed with her immortal but aging lover Tithonus, one of a series of dawn's abductees. Uh, as appears from the functional and formulaic interchangeability of Iliad 19, one uh, in the example in number two, with Iliad 11, one, the example number four in the handout, dawn rising from her bed from beside noble Tithonus to bring light to gods and mortals. And the formulaic equivalence shows that the myth of Tithonus was already a standard topos in the eighth century and one integrated into the formular cosmography of dawn and the rising sun. The sun himself, not surprisingly, both rises out of ocean and sets into ocean, Okeanos. Uh, compare the passages in number five in the handout on pages two and three uh, uh, from the Iliad. Uh, and Hesiod and Theognony puts both in a single line going up into heaven, coming down from heaven. Uh, in Iliad 11, 184, Uranothen Katabas, coming down from heaven, occupies the same hemistic as Uranion, Uranon Eisanion, going up uh, to heaven. And the same double preverb, Eisana, up into, with the verb go, appears in both Iliad and the Theogony, and we'll find many recurrences of this in the Greek poetic texts to be discussed below. They will explicate the very specific overtones of the seemingly innocuous uh, or innocent verb of motion. 
Now, Anatolian religion and myth knows no god as dawn, as we mentioned. They uh, compare number six in the handout, uh, the hausos of Greek eos and other Latin aurora and so forth, and the various de derivatives in the, Eastern, in the northern languages uh, like English east or easter. But the alluring figure of hausos who, quote, uncovers her breast as a dawn cow, her udder, that's in the Rig Veda of the goddess Ushas. Uh, dawn appears to be a later creation of uh, already dialectal Indo-European, posterior to the uh, separation of the Anatolian branch from the family, perhaps also to Carrion. Hittite has a word, an adverb, kariwariwar, meaning at dawn or er early, but no uh, personification of this exists uh, in, in Hittite. Uh, but as we saw, Anatolian religion and cosmology knows several sons, both male and female. Originally in central Anatolia, number seven in the handout, uh, we had a single autochthonous Hattic, uh, that's a pre-Hittite uh, pre population group, a solar, uh, a female so solar deity, the sun goddess of Eshtan, uh, sun goddess of the Arina, uh, later joined in Hittite by the sun god of heaven and the sun goddess of the nether world. Uh, the nether world being, again, the domain through the, which the sun passes at night to return to the east. Now, one unique and enigmatic passage uh, in an invocation to the Hittite sun god in Muwatali's prayer uh, captured the attention of Hittitologists already in the early days of the field. You have it in number eight in the handout. You come up, sun, goddess of he sun god of heaven from the sea, and you take your stand in heaven. Uh, uh, the editor of this text, uh, uh, the uh, it, Hittitologist, Israeli Hittitologist singer, uh, also notes the sun god in the water, Dinya Utu Wideni, and the cosmography is identical with that of the Homeric passages cited. Uh, uh, one should also note the unusual syntax of the first Hittite clause with the the uh, ablative arunats, meaning from the sea, is right, lo lo right dislocated around the vocative colon. Uh, and one should also note the semantic and grammatical similarity of the pre-verb plus verb sara uva to come up, uh, the similarity of this with Greek ace on a binding. An old Hittite hymn to the sun goddess of the netherworld preserved in a middle Hittite tablet uh, number nine in the handout speaks of ye servants of the sun goddess of the nether world who regularly put her to sleep and awaken her. Sasnus kitanian, tasnus kitanian quis, and this curious and surely intentionally rhyming imperfective verb forms are a metaphor for sunset and sunrise respectively. The uh, West, 19, 1997, cites a fragment of Pindar. For them, the strength of the sun shines down there while it's night here. Uh, 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 together with Sumero-Akkadian parallels, which, quote, seem to presuppose the idea that the sun, after leaving the sky at sunset, passes through the underworld and performs the same functions of giving light and administering justice as in the upper world. And, as we will see presently, the Anatolian and particularly Luvian pa parallels are much closer to, to hand. These ideas, notably that of the nocturnal judgments of the sun, also find their uh, uh, expression in the Orphic Pythagorean description of the af afterlife in Pindar's Olympian II. Uh, and the Anatolian affinities of certain Orphic notions are well known and discussed in the literature. A famous passage in the Iliad uh, provides further evidence for the vengeance of sky god and sun god uh, on the dead who have sworn false oaths. Uh, this is Iliad 3, 276 and following. Uh, 
the uh, prayer of Agamemnon beginning Zeopater and continuing Aelioste, uh, vocative followed by nominative. Uh, you have the passage in number 10 uh, before you. And this invocation recalls the litanies of deities in Morsili's plague prayers and Muatalis' prayer like, quote, male gods and female gods of the sky and the dark nether world, sky and earth, clouds and winds, thunder and lightning. We've considered so far just the Hittite evidence of in north central Anatolia, but among the Luvians of south and western Anatolia, the pair of solar deities was simply sun god Tiwats and uh, with the epithet father, number 11 in the handout, and sun goddess of the netherworld. Uh, uh, Tiwats, by the way, is the cognate of Zeus, uh, uh, the Indo-European word for the sky god. Uh, some god, uh, scholars have suggested that the sun goddess of the netherworld originated in the Luvian-speaking areas of southern Anatolia, uh, and that the old Hittite sun god of heaven is to be equated with this Luvian uh, Tiwats, this is controversial. Uh, Noy argued 30 years ago that the old Hittite, uh, the oldest Indo-European god that we have the name of, whose name is Zeus, uh, or Zeusumi, meaning our Zeus, is the sun god and the exact cognate of Greek Zeus Pater and Vedic Yosh Pitar, etymologically the god of the bright sky. Uh, while this is uncertain, it's clear that the Luvian sun god Tiwats has, from the root diu, has the epithet Tadis, meaning father, just like the Greek and the Vedic. The avenging sun god who punishes those who swear false oaths, hey, uh, number 12 in the handout, uh, hey, has an exact match in Luvian Hirutalis, Tiwats, the sun god of the oath, the sun god by whom one swears, just like Greek Horkios. Uh, and uh, you have their dual domains of the solar couple st clearly stated in the passage in Luvian that it's probably the longest piece of Luvian that most of you have ever seen. Uh, that, by the way, is also a language which we couldn't read when I was in graduate school. Uh, uh, there is progress, <laughs> but you, I won't go into uh, this, but these Anatolian, particularly Luvian divinities, their nature and their attributes are thematically very close indeed to the Greek conceptions in the passages uh, that we cited and we, that we look at, uh, we'll look at further, as are the moieties of male and female, uh, sky, earth, day, night, above, below, up, down, uh, to Greek, similar to Greek ideology and the formulas which are their vehicle. Since Anatolian knows no dawn goddess and late Indo-European Hausos does not regularly rise from the sea, it would seem reasonable to su suggest that Greek Eos represents a syncretism of the reflex of the late Indo-European female figure Hausos uh, the ancestor of Eos, and certain aspects of the Western Anatolian solar couple, the sun god and the sun goddess of the nether world. Uh, in the next section of this paper, I want to examine more closely the overtones of this verb, ace on a binane, just go up into in its deployment. Because if the cosmological goal of this verb in Greek epic is heaven, uh, uranos, its more mundane goal is bed, lechlos, and specifically the women's bedchamber, uh, the huperoion, in an upper floor or a loft which is accessed by a ladder, climax. The subject of the verb more frequently than not in its, uh, all of its attestations uh, uh, that we've looked at, the subject is a woman. And the purpose of the action is almost always sex. 
Mimnermus in the seventh century, uh, uh, this is not quite yet, uh, uh, provides as simple and straightforward a formulation of the rising of the sun from sea to sky as that of the Hittite king Muatalis when rosy-fingered dawn had left Ose Okeanos and gone up into the sky, where we have dawn plus an epithet, leaving ocean, and this doubly pre-verbed verb, ace anade, plus object, heaven. It's the same verb whose participle ace anion we saw in the passages in handout five of, uh, uh, of Homer and Hesiod of the sun going up into uh, yeah, uh, heaven. Yet in Homer and Hesiod, the commonest object of the same verb, Aesana uh, by name, is lechos, bed, as well as high places like Ilios. And dawn per personified as a female going up into the sky is the uh, uh, entirely consistent with this verb. But there is more. And with a single example of Aesana by name in the Iliad and none in the Odyssey, uh, we have no less than 11 in Hesiod, of which seven have a female subject, and so does this single I Iliadic example, Agamemnon enumerating the prizes he will give to Teucer, number 14 in the handout, either a tripod or two horses with their chariot, or a woman who will go up into your bed. In all the uh, Homeric and Hesiodic examples, the primarily sexual purpose of going up into bed is overt or implied. And the same is implied in uh, the example cited above in handout four. The action is in the reverse direction. Dawn rising from her bed beside her lover Tithonus from beside him. Uh, uh, and the same finally is implied in the unique Iliadic example of the phrase huperoion eis anabasa, a female having gone up into her bedchamber of number 15 in the handout, the Parthenos Aidoie, who bore Ascalaphos and Yalmenos to Ares, who lay with her in secret. Uh, uh, the overtness of huperoion in the Odyssey is entirely different, by the way. Uh, uh, and this is wholly consistent with the erotic figuration of the divine, the female divinity, Hausos, everywhere in uh, the late Indo-European world. Now we find unexpected corroboration of the sexual overtones of the simple action go up into in Greek art, in depictions of aspects of the wedding ritual uh, in vase painting and sculpture. Sarah Morris kindly supplied me with a reference to an article, uh, a 1984 article of Edwards uh, with the suggestive title, Aphrodite on a Ladder. Uh, Edwards studies, documents, and illustrates a number of representations in painting and sculpture of a ladder with a girl or Aphrodite descending or ascending as symbol of the ascent of the bride on her wedding night to the thalamus or bridal chamber in the women's quarters on the second floor, or the end of her descent on the following morning for the epaulia or day after the wedding gift giving ceremony. The latter is often discreetly in the background, but its symbolic function is clear enough. As he states, the simplest meaning of the latter is a means of ascent or descent. The, uh, in the Lebes Gamikos in the Athens National Museum, you have a picture of it in number uh, 16, uh, uh, the little arrow under, underneath points to the arrow. You can barely see it in the photograph, but it's, it's there. Uh, he says, the presence of the ladder with its attendants, like the uncovered uh, marriage vessel, recalls the event of the preceding previous night when the then maiden ascended the ladder and her state in life was forever changed, end quote. He'd noted earlier that ladders are the means of access to a beached ship, and I might also add would be the natural uh, way of getting into another vessel like a depos, uh, a cup, uh, and ladders are part of the seed scene in Greek art as they were in Neo-Hittite art. Uh, Trevor Bryce's uh, uh, Hittite uh, history has a picture of a, a Neo-Hittite ladder in a siege uh, 
on its cover. We learned from Aeschylus in uh, the Septem uh, that the latter's rungs were called the, quote, means of ascent, a, uh, a sort of kenning number 17 in the handout, the, uh, the going up onto's with double preverb. Uh, again, this, the word recurs in Euripides. And the act of descending a ladder from the women's quarters on the second story, number 18, is not surprisingly uh, simply going down the ladder as in an often cited passage of Lysias 1. Pindar attests the word for ladder only twice in our attested corpus, uh, climax, both times in fragments, but both times in highly charged and significant contexts. Uh, fragment 162 describes the overweening, number 19, no, the overweening mountain piling exploit of Otis and Ephialtes, stretching a swift ladder to high heaven. You could think of this as a siege scene, uh, but uh, the goal of the ladder, just as in Mimnermus and other solar cosmologies, is Uranus, Uranus, or heaven. And fragment 30, uh, number 20 in the handout, it, most of his trophy from his opening hymn, One to Zeus, describes the marriage of Themis and Zeus' savior in elusive and traditional language. Uh, you have it uh, before you. Uh, I've modified William Race's translation in the light of the role of the ladder, uh, just <coughs> discussed. It's not a staircase, which uh, uh, Race uh, said. And the Indo-European touch of the active verb again as the verb to lead the bride to the husband's home, uh, which is the same verb in, uh, as the verb to lead water in irrigation, uh, hudor again in, uh, in Greek. It's not in LSJ, but it's in, uh, it's in Plato. Uh, and it's the same. <coughs> identity of these verbs uh, for leading the bride and leading water uh, recurs in Latin deductio in domum uh, the, uh, for the first and aquae ductus aqueduct for the second. First, uh, the beginning uh, proton uh, of this Pindaric uh, fragment is an Indo-European theme and the phrase from the springs of, Oke of ocean, Okeanu Parapagan, is bound to recall the solar traje trajectory, the rising of dawn from the sea. Uh, and synchronically, these splendid verses press Pindar's arc to its limits. The homoio teleuta uranian pagan semnon, the almost rhyming pagan agon, modulating to hodon and emen are the strokes of the master. And the whole is framed by the double epithets of Themis in the first line and the triple epithets of the Horai in the last with their ascending abstraction. And when Pindar does that, he's being indexical. He's calling attention to his message. Now, Greek customary domestic architecture the, uh, already before Homer thus provided for women's quarters on the upper floor a uh, term the huperoion, accessed by ascending or descending a ladder, the climax, and the cultural associations of both Greek terms with sex are natural enough and documentable both in literature and in art. Now, it seems to have gone unnoticed that this cultural feature of Greek domestic architecture is shared with Anatolia, a, uh, where it's documented at a comparable period uh, in the 10th or the early 9th century BC, the reign of a King Katuwas in Carchemish in the upper Euphrates. Uh, you have the passage in number 21 in the handout, uh, uh, and these upper floors as Tawani apartments I made for Anas, my beloved wife. Uh, since the world's cutest writing system, you have an example of it uh, there. If you want to practice reading it, it reads from right to left, but you have to read down each column as you move from right to left. Uh, the world's cutest writing system is uh, also the world's least reader-friendly. 
in transliteration. I, uh, I give a phonetic version, uh, uh, which sounds more like a language uh, you have there. And the domus super, these are de hieroglyphic determinatives, uh, haris danincy, as in parallel passages, denoted the upper floor of the law or lo loft, which is also used for storage of grain in a Hittite text. And uh, the hieroglyph domus plus scala, a, uh, the before the women's quarters, the Tawaninsi, which is reached by a ladder, which is overt in the hieroglyphic sign. You see, it's, it's just the the the, uh, the the sign for house with a little ladder running in uh, diagonally through it. A, uh, if the sexual innu innuendos of uh, Homeric and Hesiodic Huber uh, Huperoion and Climax are uh, Homer Homeric are not surprisingly absent in Anatolia. The association of Domus plus Scala Tawani with conjugal happiness worthy of monumental co co commemoration. I mean, this is a huge basalt uh, stele uh, that records the building. Uh, uh, I hate what amounts to a harem. Uh, is it certainly there? And in the fourth part of my paper, Roman four in the handout, I want to examine more closely the formulaic behavior of a set of this set of passages in seventh, sixth, and early fifth century Greek poetry, figuring these trajectories of dawn or the sun. And these will then culminate in the new Sappho. It, dawn, Eos as the rising sun, goes up into the sky, as we've seen in, in Mimnermus. Uh, in, uh, num we saw it in number 13 in the handout. But once there, she seems to be simply the male uh, uh, sun, Helios, like the Hittite sun god of heaven who comes up from the sea. The, uh, the Athenaeus, uh, talking about drinking vessels and specifically Depas, cites the Mimnermus passage as, quote, hinting at the hollow of the drinking cup uh, when he calls the Depos a bed. Uh, Mimnermus must also be hitting, hinting at uh, what he described uh, sounding a bit like cosmic traffic problems. In number 22, you have the passage in full. Uh, just how we are lines of in number 23 in the handout uh, as emended principally by Barrett and West. Here we find the first overt, overt mention of the depas as a conveyance of the sun across Okeanos, although it was implicit in Minermus a generation earlier. And the passage in the Garuanes continued with the actions of Heracles, who had borrowed the depas for his own transportation. Uh, there's a picture of Heracles in his depas on page 10, in, uh, if you want to peek at that. A, uh, not surprisingly, ace katabino to go up, go down into, and ace anabino to go up into are treated as metrically identical in the early, the epic hexameter corpus. They occupy the Adani clausula, just as going up into heaven and going down from heaven are, occupy the same metrical slot in the beginning of the line. Uh, we saw that, and the context of either of these, uh, or the choice of either of these, go up or, d or go down, is entirely contextual. It belongs, if you will, to the plane of parole rather than long. And we may retain that formulaically, uh, depas ace anabinane or ace katabinane to go up uh, into the cup to. Uh, Lechos, ace on a binane to go up into bed, Hyperoion, ace on a binane to go up into the women's quarters, and Uranon, ace on a binane to go up to heaven. They are all, these are all commutational var uh, variants, and each noun can be substituted for the other. And that's the way formulas work. Uh, this Stesichorus passage has many verbal echoes in a fragment of Aeschylus's Daughters of the Sun. You have it in number 24, uh, which is also cited by Athenaeus for the word depas. 
uh, uh, it's number 24, though not quoted by Athenaeus, Aeschylus mentions the same depas as used by Heracles in his 10th labor of stealing the cattle of Gerouan in a fragment of the children of Heracles, which I cite in number 25, the first two lines. And these two are the only, the only attestations of depas in our attested corpus of Aeschylus. The, uh, the episode contains echoes of the Garuanes passages passage in Sisychorus, uh, as it does of the new Sappho, the word depos itself, and the phrase to the ends of the earth, eschatagas, uh, the new Sappho to which we now turn. Uh, I give in handout 26 uh, the complete 12 page, 12 line text of the new of the Sappho's new poem, previously known in part as 58 Feucht, with West's conjectures for the missing four to six syllables in the first four lines. It's the mythological exemplum of the last four lines, which interests us really here. And I give the controversial line 10, the third from the end, as printed in the original editor, by the original editors, including the emendation of Eis on Bamenai to Eis om Bamenai for dialect reasons, because in the lesbian dialect of Greek there is no preposition of preverb ana, it's always, it's simply on. Uh, uh, the translation is mine. Uh, and I must postpone to another day dwelling on the poetics of this extraordinary text as a whole. Uh, suffi suffice it to say that this poem on aging speaks immediately to somebody who translated it on his 73rd birthday. <laughs> now Martin West finds Ero Depas Ace um, Om Bamenai of line 10 as, quote, quite unsatisfactory for alleged thematic, mythographic, lexical, and poetic reasons. Yet it's hard to resist this new mythology of the Tithonus tale in its verbal expression, just like Stesichorus's Depas es Kateba and Mimnermus's Uranon Ace on a Bay. Uh, as we saw, ace anabino to go up into and ace katabino to go, uh, uh, go down into are formulaically identical, as well as metrical. And for dawn to go up into the bowl for lust, perhaps, or love, as would seem quite appropriate after an, abduc an abduction, hey, uh, is despite West immediately comparable to the sexually directed ep epic Lechos Ace Anabinein, Hyperoion Ace Anabinein, and for this very reason might well have appealed to Sappho. As I said, the Depas has become a love nest into which Dawn carries off Tithonus, bearing him to the ends of the earth. West argu argues for a reading which I've given in number 27. Uh, with a participle of a verb which he translates gratuitously, uh, since the verb isn't there, uh, as love smitten. Uh, one might argue from the absence of a citation of the Sappho in Athenaeus uh, of when he's talking about Depas, that no mention of Depas existed in Sappho, but this argument from silence is invalidated by the fact that Athenaeus doesn't cite the, the Depas in uh, Aeschylus's Children of Heracles either. But the main problem with the participial solution is that neither Martin West nor anybody else, and I discussed this with uh, my UCLA colleague Michael Haslam, nobody can come up with the right Greek verb. And are we so really sure that it does exist? Most recently, Richard Janko, in the last issue of the TLS uh, uh, for uh, last year, also in 27, suggested another res restoration of the damaged wording in line 10, ero lalageisan bamanai, uh, which he trans, uh, translates as, quote, literally, murmuring with love. 
While I'm not competent to judge the papyrology, I find murmuring with love a very unlikely rendition of a verb which is glossed in the principle in the dictionary of Liddell Scott Jones and by the translators in the lexica of Pindar as meaning chirp, babble, or prattle. That's lala gain. It's an unflattering, unflattering and inept description of dawn, beside, despite the putative references to Tithonus's ultimate fate, uh, ending up sounding like a uh, locust. Uh, still, at this point, perhaps given the authority of Martin West, Michael Haslam, and Richard Janko, prudence might advise re retaining the role of Tithonus, but discarding Depas Ace Ambamanai from the new Sappho from discarding it from the set of thematically and verbally formulaically trans and interrelated passages of which it seems the very capstone. Uh, and I still, I don't, I don't obviously think so. Uh, I still maintain that Depas Aesanabinane, Lechos Aesanabinane, Hyperoion, and Uranon are formulaically commutational variants, and you can't discard all of them or any of the others. All these Greek passages, as we see, are clearly thematically and mythographically in a very real sense the same. They tell of the rising of the sun at dawn in the east, the nightly journey of the sun back from west to east in a vessel termed a depas. Dawn is a principal actant, Tithonus an optional one. Whether Sappho really figured the mounting of the love nest bowl, the depas, or not, and I believe that she did, uh, other passages make clear the central image of going up into or down into a depas, an action which is formulaically equivalent to going up into the sky or up into bed or into the bedroom for lovemaking. And if in, uh, in an uncertain but possible reading of the newly uh, discovered papyrus of a great poet, if there we find indications of a new artistic combination of all these formulas, motifs, and overtones, then prudence might indicate that we should accept it. Now let's look once more now across the ocean, across the water to Anatolia for the remainder of this paper. Roman 6. In number 28, you have the hieroglyphic Luvian sign for the sky, Hilo. And it's as I have drawn it there, and it looks very much like a bowl. Uh, there's also a variant. Uh, the phonetic reading is Dibas. Beside the cuneiform Luvian form, which is Dapas. Uh, you can read the etymology. I won't bother concerning it. It's an, an Indo-European uh, inheritance, uh, 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 but rather changed. Uh, it's not entirely clear whether this is borrowed. Actually, the word is borrowed from a, uh, into Greek from hieroglyphic Luvian or from cuneiform Luvian. Uh, Either is likely, since Luvian, uh, Luvian doesn't have a vowel e, uh, e and Luvian a is rendered as Greek epsilon in 11th, in first millennium onomastics in uh, western and southern Anatolia. The city of Ephesus, that you know as Ephesus, uh, is apasas in, uh, in, in Luvian. Uh, the phonetic similarity of depas, to, which is already there in the second millennium in Mycenaean uh, Greek, uh, together with the iconicity of the pictorial representation, didn't escape the attention of Hittitologists and Hellenists alike. And Chantrain, in his etymological dictionary of Greek, uh, as early as 1968, says of the Greek word depas, simply uh, perhaps borrowed from Luvian. And uh, David Hawkins uh, 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 published an article in which he uh, uh, notes a new hieroglyphic Luvian inscription on a silver bowl 
where the inscribed object is referred to as this dapi. He, and he compares the formal relation of this dapi with a Hittite word dapisana, which is a kind of bowl used in ritual uh, in Hittite. A, uh, and the spelling of it, Melchert concludes, uh, is maybe just a rebus-like spelling, kylum plus p with a picture, uh, based on the associations of the notion of bowl and the hieroglyphic sign for heaven, which uh, seem real enough, uh, as he states. Uh, but if kylum plus p is to be read dapi and clearly means bowl, whatever the origin of the word, the associations between a dapi bowl and a dibas or a dapas, meaning heaven or sky, could also simply rest on phonetic and iconic similarity. And for just how real these connections are, consider the example in number 29 in the handout. Uh, this is relief 28 or 29 of the main chamber of the rock sanctuary of Yazilikaya outside Boazke. Uh, and the rock sanctuary of uh, Yazilikaya is a holy place. It's the Alamo of the Hittites, if you will. They, uh, notice the pictures of it in 30, uh, number 30 and number 31. And, and it depicts two upright bulls or bull men standing on the earth, and that's the hieroglyph for earth, and that's the hieroglyph for sky. They're holding up the sky with human uh, hands. Uh, it's a 19th century uh, drawing because the site has weathered, unfortunately, a great deal since, since then. Uh, uh, you have the photographs, as I said, what it looks like now in number 30 uh, and what the, what the relief looked like in, in the middle of the 19th century in number 31. The two men, the bull men standing on earth and holding up heaven are focally central. The group uh, attests, quote, a, mo a momentum, momentous artistic change. Uh, that's an art historian, uh, Alexander, talking uh, uh, and in these figures, uh, the sculptor, and uh, Alexander refers to him uh, rather nicely as the Yazilikaya master, he, uh, has labeled the, the frames, heaven and earth, I mean, they're simply with the hieroglyphs, he, uh, and uh, cutting into the lower one, the earth, to make very specific the idea conveyed by the hieroglyph. The feet of the gods and bull men alike press on the surface of the earth at the ground level, and what is cut out below for the sign is the chthonic netherworld. And the same sign, uh, this Laroche 201, uh, for, uh, uh, which circled uh, its Deus Via plus Terra, the divine earth road, whose constituent signs correspond one for one with cuneiform dingir kaskal kar, kur, uh, which is the word for the uh, under uh, a, uh, a uh, <coughs> underground water course, natural or artificial, which is a cultic entrance to the netherworld, as in the monument in uh, uh, the, the so-called tomb of Supiluliumas II in Boaz Curry itself, in Hatusas. Uh, in 1996, uh, Hawkins published another inscribed bowl, a, uh, Ankara, uh, uh, beginning likewise this tapi, uh, uh, kailumpi, this bowl, and continuing so-and-so dedicated for himself, and adding the remarkable dating phrase, when Tutalia Labarna, that's the Hittite king's title, smote the land of Tarwitsa, he made it in that year. The, uh, the toponym, this Tarwitsa, or perhaps to be read Truitsa, uh, is probably to be identified with the Hittite, the land of Tarwitsa, attested only in the Middle Hittite annals of King Tutalias I, 
or the second, number 34 in the handout, the great-grandfather of Supiluliumas I, the founder of the Hittite New Kingdom. The uh, <coughs> identification, of course, of this toponym with the city name Troy was suggested long ago. Uh, it remains subiudice. Uh, I don't have an opinion on this. It was suggested finally by Hawkins that the bowl and its, its appellation, Dapi, belonged to the time of Tutalias I, or, uh, who ruled around 1400 BC, which is the time of the Hittite defeat of the Aswa coalition in Western Anatolia, and the doubtless concomitant arrival both of the word Dipas and of the names Aswios or Potnia Aswia into Ahiawa, the Hittite, uh, the Mycenaean world, the Hittite word for the Mycenaean world, uh, where it's attested in uh, Greek. Aswia simply means, you know, sort of somebody from Aswa. Uh, this is the Homeric name, Aasios. Uh, the dating must remain, again, subiudica, because the epigraphic forms of the sign seems to be at variance with an early, so early a date in Middle Hittite. But King Tutalias I also dedicated to the storm god on this occasion a, uh, the bronze longsword discovered in 1991, which is uh, uh, of likely Western Anatolian or Aegean production. It bears a cuneiform inscription in Akkadian, beginning with the dating formula, when Tutkhalias, the great king, destroyed the land of Aswa. Inuma Tutkhalia Lugalgal Kur Uru Aswa Uchalik. The dating phrase on the sword is stylistically virtually identical with the dating phrase on the, on the, of the hieroglyphs on the bowl when Tutkhalias Labarna smote the land of Tarwitsa. And inscribed objects are very rare in ancient Anatolia, uh, as Hawkins noted, and Tutkhalias clearly wished to commemorate his important achievement. It's the first manly deed of his reign. And the identical dating phrase to that of the sword, which is dedicated uh, as booty, uh, 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 it appears, I mean, this phrase in Akkadian appears in Hittite in the later annals of the same king. Uh, and as Hawkins has insisted, the selection for the, of the defeat of Tarwitsa for use in a dating formula gives it a similar prominence, uh, and it implies greater importance for cuneiform Tarwisa than other, might otherwise be inferred from its sole attestation as one of a number of defeated Aswa countries. And perhaps we really do have a glimpse of a 15th century Trojan War. That one of the two inscribed objects is a sword, said to be of Western Anatolian Aegean provenance, uh, number 35 in the handout, compare Mycenaean Pakana. Uh, and the other is a bowl called a dapi, uh, Mycenaean dipa, is surely striking. And this bowl, you have a picture of it in number 35 in the handout, uh, may be compared with the picture of the hieroglyph Kylum itself. They look virtually identical. Uh, and for that matter, it can be compared with the Depas transporting Heracles much later in the Duras vase in cup in the, in the Vatican. Uh, and that's, uh, as you see, the, con the conjunction of word and picture remains. The notion of the sky as a great inverted bowl is very widespread, whether it's inverted or not. Uh, uh, and alluvian Depas remains the likeliest source of the Greek name for the artifact in the second millennium. One may be permitted to wonder whether there might have been some further Anatolian influence on Greek poetic culture and cosmography uh, involving this particular word and its associations, either in the Bronze Age at the time of its initial borrowing into Mycenaean Greek or in later sub-Mycenaean or Dark Age times. We've seen the Greek phrase, uranon eis anion, uh, going up into heaven. And we have semantically what amounts to the same uh, 
verb phrase in hieroglyphic Luvian in an inscription from Carchemish circa 800, uh, number 36 in the passage, which simply says that the storm god Tarhunsas and the sky god, the, the, and the sun, go the storm god Tarhunsas and the sky, sun god Tiwatsas caused my name to pass up to heaven. The third plural uh, uh, verb is incomplete, uh, but this is a causative of a verb of motion. The word heaven in the dative tipasi is preceded by the determiner kailum, uh, with the picture as you have it. Uh, it thus has the semantics of uranos, heaven, but it has the graphic form of depas, the bowl. And surely it's no coincidence that the Western Anatolian borrowing Mycenaean dipas has the phonetic form of Anatolian tipas or tapas, dipas or dapas, but the semantics of its icon, the picture of the bowl. The topos in Carchemish recalls Iliad, uh, Odyssey 920, Kai Meocleos, Uranon Hike, uh, my fame reaches up to heaven, uh, the boast of, uh, of Odysseus. Uh, uh, and this is a topos readily intelligible in either culture, Greek or Anatolian. The sun god made my name reach up to heaven, or my fame reaches up to heaven. Uh, and the striking coincidence of syntax, semantics, and visual image in the Greek and hieroglyphic Luvian passages, I believe, point clearly and unequivocally to Greco-Western Anatolian Luvian contact and cultural transmission from east to west. The cultural transmission of a mythology as well as a lexeme can and does explain not only how a word for bowl or cup, depas, can come from a word for sky or heaven in Western Anatolia, but also why that bowl or cup is found precisely in a single locus of solar mythology and cosmography in Greek poetry in the 8th, 7th, 6th, and early 5th centuries. And if you look at number 37 in the handout on the final page, number 12, my demonstration of this rests schematically and thematically on the formulas as displayed there, uh, dawn, the, I've not bothered to translate them, but they are all passages more or less in the order that we saw them beginning, uh, dawn ro ro <coughs> rose from the streams of ocean, uh, and you see the verbs ace on a, ba on a bay and the object oranon, uh, and uh, so forth, and then the, uh, uh, Aelios Depas Ace Kateba went down into the Depas, and in Sappho, uh, Dawn uh, was said to come go into the Depas. Uh, it continues with the uh, words for uh, the ladder. Uh, and the final Greek example is the one from Pindar which repeats every single one of the formula of the thematic uh, uh, forms, uh, features that we've discussed. Themin uranion, heavenly themis, uh, from Okeanu Parapagan, from the, the uh, springs of ocean. Potiklimaka semnan, uh, the, to the holy ladder, Agon, they led. And for the Greek, Pindar, as always, has the final word. Thank you. period, but before that gets underway, I'll, by the way, I'll let Cal pick the questioners, but um, uh, you're all invited after the official uh, proceedings in this room are over, you're all invited to the department on the third floor for uh, a little reception, uh, modest, but I hope pleasant, uh, 
uh, for the next 45 minutes or so from 6 o'clock. So thank you. Cal. As we say in Southern California, algunas preguntas. <laughs> <laughs> Here, seeing none, <laughs> I assume that you're, I'll yes. I'll jump in just a little bit, uh, it, it uh, occurred to me, you know, the famous um, uh, Botticelli uh, painting of, of, you know, Venus, um, you know, rising on the half shell uh, uh, out yeah. of the ocean, and um, I wonder if, you know, that could be fitted into the um, picture somehow. Uh, well, it, it certainly, Af in, uh, I mean, Aphrodite is often regarded as, uh, uh, you know, related to uh, to Eos, to Dawn. In, in uh, I mean, this, people like Debbie Bodeker wrote about that a long time ago, and others since. Uh, I mean, it's. Uh, I'm not sure whether this is, I mean, it's, this is, after all, Botticelli's no. uh, uh, <laughs> rather than a Greek notion, but, but uh, I don't know, why not? Yeah, well, I, I'm thinking of base paintings of Dawn uh, carrying off her various uh, paramours, uh, Tecumas or mm -hmm. Stephalus, and I don't remember the Depos in any of them. I don't know. Yeah, no, this, no, oh, I, I, I agree entirely, and, and uh, uh, also the, the uh, you know, the editors of the Sappho real say that simply this is new, yeah. in, as, as uh, uh, mythographic icon, so, uh, but you're, you're, you're quite right. Yes. You're absolutely right about the problem I'm glad to hear that you say so. I'm um, surprised if anyone who defends, defends their views. Uh, well, we shall see. I, I have not yet had the courage to send this paper to Mark. <laughs> <laughs> or the chutzpah. Uh, <laughs> Yes, Ron. I'd like to continue in the tradition of asking the um, uh, elementary stupid question. Um, does Depas have a, a clear etymology? Uh, is it possibly supposed that it could be a loan word um, carrying the metaphor of heaven to all and then that becoming? Oh, well, yes, that, I mean, that, uh, that's already in Champagne. Uh, okay. uh, that it's, uh, uh, as far as etymology is concerned, etymologically, it's, it's, it's the Nephos word. Uh, in, 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 in Anatolian, with an um, irregular change of initial D to uh, uh, initial N to has been stopped. Uh, Did you first propose that? I mean, no, no, that's that's that was perfectly obvious from when you know for the last 50, 60 years. Uh -huh. Octa, um, I just uh, uh, get the association been happening for many, many years. But um, there, there aren't that many verbs with double three verbs in Avestan, but one of them is the one which our Ramasta uses to address Anaita when he asks her to come down to the earth, uh -huh. which is the other direction, Paiti Awa Jasa. Uh -huh. so, uh, no, that's, that's very interesting. Uh, I thank you. Whatever the implications might be for what she has been doing. <laughs> In a word, uh, really. Uh, I mean, of course, you're right. It's obvious that had to happen. There was no yeah. choice about it. But, but why? Why it did so? Uh, 
I, I don't know. It must have, it might have something to do with this, you know, odd, you know, the the the, the uh, uh, you know, N to L. I mean, this uh, dissimulation in in Laman and Lay and uh, so forth. But uh, as to why that happened. Yep, Connor. Uh, are, are there any other ways that this is being an irregular change or anything other than the. Not that I can, can think of, I don't think, unless you know. Well, I don't have any case of that, but it might be noted that Anatolian is full of examples of expected initial ends disappearing and turning into other things. Yeah, I mean the word for the word for name is lama. The the prohibitive neg negation is lay. I mean it's not nay. Uh, and and the, the Lydian word for name might be mentioned here too in yeah. some way. Yeah. Um, yeah, the, uh, yeah. Right. Sounds like you have a combination of stuff that's trying to understand stuff that's being said before you can <laughs> no doubt, no doubt. Richard. Yeah, there's there's a, um, an instance of anabining that might help. It combines both the siege and the sex sense in Menander's uh, Peri Kairomene, where I, I have higher efforts that be good at anabining and Peri Kathis on it. And it clearly is, uh -huh. is laying siege to the yeah, yeah. other places too. Good. <laughs> I'll get I'll take the reference. Okay, well, thank you. Yeah, well,